Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up later in the show, we'll meet writer and artist Denise Lajmadir. But first, joining me now on the show is retired professor of English, Dr. Mitzi Brunsdale. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brunsdale, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, as we start off, you, of course, you're here to talk about a book you wrote mm -hmm. on James Harriet. And, but before we get into the book, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background. I am actually a comparative lit person. Uh, I've done a lot of writing, uh, nine books to date. Um, and most recently, I write on Norwegian murder mysteries. Norwegian murder yes. mysteries. Well, yes. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> interesting. Well, mm -hmm. you know, with that said, tell us more about your writing and your teaching career. Uh, I love to teach. Um, I've taught most of my time uh, near Mayville, North Dakota, where my husband farmed. And that's why I was so interested in Harriet, because the place and the people he worked among were very much like what we were working with in North Dakota. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. the book you wrote here, uh, of course, PBS viewers may recognize mm -hmm. the name. Uh, he, of course, he was a British veterinarian, mm -hmm. but author of, uh, mm -hmm. of course, All Creatures Great and Small. So yes. w why did you develop an interest in writing about him? <laughs> I had read his books and loved them when I was younger. And I had just finished a book on James Joyce, the Irish author, who was very complicated, very scholarly work, very hard work. I was tired. And the editor of Twain's English Authors series called me about two days after I finished the Joyce book and said, would you like to write on James Harriet? And I said, I would get down on my knees to write on James Harriet. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so, so but, yeah, but again, where, where did that big interest come from? Just I love animals. I've had animals all my life, and I've never met a vet I didn't like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Twain, English mm -hmm. author. I guess they have a se Twain's English author series. Yes. Tell us more about that. Yes, uh, the idea was to produce books that the average ordinary author uh, would write for the ordinary public, not for scholars, not for people who were specialists in the field, to bring that author's work to a bigger public. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, I mean, do you know how many authors they work with or how, how, oh, goodness. how many books? Oh, goodness, I think there were over 30 in the series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, okay. Well, uh, let's go back a little bit to James Harriet, I guess, because mm -hmm. I understand because of his declining health at the time of your mm -hmm. writing of the book. Uh, can you talk about the difficulty in contacting him and, and trying to meet him? He was camera shy. Uh, he didn't like to give interviews. He had been on authors' tours in this country twice, and that was enough for him. Um, people were swarming the Yorkshire Dales to meet him. He said his right hand gave out from autographs. Um, and so toward the end of his life, though no one knew it at the time, he was suffering from prostate cancer. He and his son uh, were trying to get some black-faced sheep out of their garden. And in the process, one of the sheep knocked him against a stone wall. Poor man broke his leg in several places. And that winter, the next winter, he passed away. So his health was very, very fragile and we were not able to meet with him in person. Mm -hmm. Well, and we've talked a little bit off camera, mm -hmm. but can, can you talk a little bit about your interactions with, with his wife? We didn't see much of her or hear much about her. Uh, she was apparently a very practical lady, and when he started writing in the late 1960s, she told him several times that old vets of 50 years old didn't write books. And he said that inspired him, and he went out and bought paper and a typewriter, and he started in his writing. And it proved to be very, very popular. Mm. Well, let's talk about your book for a moment. How did you mm -hmm. organize the book in, into various chapters? I, I organized it around the books that he wrote. Um, he wrote five books based on stories that he had experienced himself and that his friends had experienced as veterinarians in the Yorkshire Dales. He wrote about all, about one year of his life per book. And these were set in the late 1930s. So he was, as an older man, he was writing about his younger self and his work then. And he did spend two years um, in the RAF during World War II. And when he came back to his veterinary work, 
he realized that all of a sudden the world had changed with antibiotics and new operations and all kinds of things. So his practice had changed from basically draft horses to small animal practice. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With that said, uh, mm -hmm. can you read us a passage from your book and oh, give certainly. us a little taste or flavor? Certainly. Uh, this is uh, about his comments about the man who was the actor playing him in the first BBC movie written that they worked on. And he said, and as a very modest man, he said, I have always been puzzled by the fact that Simon Ward, who was playing me, told me later that he was absolutely petrified at the prospect of meeting me. For a man who had just made a great name for himself playing Winston Churchill, it seemed odd. An obscure country vet was certainly insignificant by contrast. Hmm. <laughs> well, and you mentioned uh, in, in uh, getting to, to do research, I guess, on this book, mm -hmm. you, you met or talked to, with the actor. Yes, yes. Um, we, had, we had hoped to meet Dr. Harriet, but his health prevented it. So we were traveling in Yorkshire uh, in 1975, and we stayed at a little town called Askrig, which is in the Yorkshire Dales, very near where he practiced. And it just happened that that day they were filming uh, a passage, and we, got, we could talk to any of the actors or any of the workers, but we could not get near their cars. The vintage automobiles that they had for the, for the series were brought there in big trucks, and they had them out, but you couldn't get near them. That was very, very sacred. What did you learn, though, from the actor at, over that time? How very impressed he was with how humble a man he was playing. Uh, Christopher Timothy, the actor, had been a classical actor uh, from Wales originally. He played Harriet for 13 years and became typecast, so he never did much work after that. But he was very, very uh, taken with the role um, he learned a lot, he said, about the veterinary practice in having to actually show it on the film. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. so as you, you mentioned a little bit about modest, but what kind mm -hmm. of person was James Harriet? Quiet, unassuming. Uh, he wanted to be known as 99% veterinarian and 1% writer. And in that 1% writer, uh, he wrote 18 books, nine for children and the others for adults. Um, he, he, I think it's best exemplified maybe by the anecdote he has in one of his books. He was traveling around the Dales with a friend, and they stopped at a, at a farm where there were some sick animals, and Harriet was going to treat them. And he introduced the friend to the farmer, saying that this man had come to see him as a veterinary uh, surgeon. And the farmer said, well, he's not a bad vet either. And that meant more to him, I think, than the writing. Hmm. Hmm. You know, mm -hmm. did, did you get a sense of what his view of the world uh, was in his life? Definitely. Uh, many times in the literature that appeared about him, he was quoted as saying that his books were all about hard work and integrity. And I think that's what makes him so fascinating for us now. Hmm. You know, again, so why did he decide to write a book after all those years as a vet? Uh, I mean, you mentioned his wife mm -hmm. made, uh, inspired him with her <laughs> yes, comments. But. Yes, um, he, he would come home and tell her funny stories about things that had happened to him. And uh, that's when he started thinking maybe he should write all those things down. And later on, he said all of it had actually happened. Most of it to him, but some of it to some of his friends. But it was all true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So did you get a sense of what he thought of the PBS series that of course followed that probably made him more internationally famous? He liked it very, very much. He would watch it religiously himself. Uh, in England, I believe the first series was put on, uh, on Sundays and there were actually church services that changed their time so people could get home and watch it. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure there were. Uh, after you published your book, uh, did you have a chance to, to uh, hear from his wife or under, understand what his, her reaction was to the book? No, um, 
as I say, they were very, they wanted to be very private people. Uh, his son has written a book uh, much later, and it's excellent. It draws on letters and things that nobody could have had any access to except his family. Okay. Well, we're going to ask you to read another couple of passages. Maybe you have one picked out now. All right, I do. Um, in the Early History of Veterinary Medicine by Sir Frederick Smith, he describes what a good vet should be. A gentle, amiable man of great benevolence and humanity, a prodigious worker, ever faithful to the cause he undertook to serve, a pioneer of the veterinary art whose name is written in letters of gold upon the tablets of his profession. Hmm. He felt that, Harriet felt that there was a great relationship between animals and humans. And he actually suggested that there was an element of healing with a sick person and an animal. And I think when we work with therapy animals, and I have one, um, I take her to um, Alzheimer's patients, and you can see that there is definitely an interaction between them. Um, Harriet was one of the first people to point that out. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very val valuable lesson for us. Okay. Well, you made the comment a while ago mm -hmm. that, that uh, he was 99% vet and 1% mm -hmm. uh, writer. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, he wrote a number of books. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, what does that really mean? Uh, yeah, what, what did you really mean he by that? He had hoped at the beginning, because veterinary work was very ill-paid in England, and he had hoped to make a little bit more money that way. Uh, and oddly enough, his books took off much better in the United States than they had in England. And he thought that that was because Americans were better animal lovers than the British, and because we have a better sense of humor. And he saw his humorous stories, and many of them are humorous, that there is an incongruity between human actions and the more reasonable actions of animals. I like, I like the way you put more reasonable uh -huh, reactions. Uh -huh. yeah. talk, talk about the research that you had to do for all of this. Oh, goodness. Uh, so many things impacted his life. One of, one of the things that I had to struggle with, because I'm not in science or medicine, was that he was a victim of brucellosis, which has largely been stamped out in our country. But at the time he started working as a vet in the late 30s in England, it was pretty much accepted that almost everybody working with animals in stockyards or even as a veterinarian would come down with it. And it, it apparently was something that at that time they couldn't do much about. Now with antibiotics and so forth, I think they can control it very well. But he would have episodes where he would feel faint where he would just feel absolutely fatigued, unable to work, and so forth. And that was, a, that was hard for me to investigate because I'm not in the medical field. But I was amazed at, at what a serious risk the veterinarians were taking to their lives and their ability to practice by having to work with sick animals. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, so your research took how long? Um, about two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, what do you feel like the reaction's been uh, with, to your book with, uh, mm -hmm. within the teaching community and otherwise? I gave a little talk to the uh, North Dakota Library Association, and they felt that it was a wonderful, the books of Harriet's, even the uh, supposedly adult books, would be wonderful for high school work. Uh, they did feel the vocabulary might be a little tough, and I was rather surprised at that because I feel he's very approachable. But I think people who love animals find these books absolutely irresistible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what is the first question you would have asked Mr. Harriet if you'd been mm -hmm. able to meet him? He was offered many times positions in countries like Ireland where he wouldn't have to pay so much income tax and he always turned it down because he wanted to stay with his practice. And I would have asked him what sacrifices he had to make in order to do that. He was 
at the height of his popularity, uh, he was paying about 83% of his income to the inland revenue in Britain. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Okay. So, um, well, if, if you can't pick out mm -hmm. another passage for us, and while you're uh -huh. looking for that, I'd, I'd even ask you, so uh, what's li your life not, uh, like now in retirement? Oh, well, would you like the passage well, first? Well, let's, let's answer the question, I guess, first. Oh, let's okay. go that way. Okay, yeah. I'm still writing, and I, I can't turn it off. Uh, I review for Publishers Weekly, and I do mostly European murder fiction. Uh, I just received a nomination oh, two years ago for the Edgar Award with the Mystery Writers of America. Mm -hmm. For an encyclopedia I wrote about, oh goodness, about all five of the Nordic countries and their murder mysteries since 1967. So, 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 yeah, murder mysteries. So, yes. so how many books have, have you worked on? And Nine. 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 Okay, and how many more do you think you have in you? <laughs> <laughs> right now, I'm taking care of my husband. Oh, okay. um, and it's it's difficult. Someone, someone once said books are like vampires. They drain you. And they do. They do. If you're going to put yourself into it as you should. Um, but the reviewing is good because I get to see things. We work about two and a half to three months ahead of publication so that I get to see the new trends coming out, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to see. I do believe the Scandinavian countries are coming out with some extremely important work, maybe in some respects better than ours right now. Okay, well that, that other passage you had for us. Oh, can, yes. Let's see if we can uh, read that now. It'd be great to have. Uh, Something happened once which really put me in a bad mood. Harriet is writing. A man came in who wanted his dog put down. The gent owed him uh, for 10 years, but then he got married for the second time and the new wife wouldn't accept the dog. The man was heartbroken. I had to put his pet down even though I didn't want to. It's better to do it that way. If you refuse, some people will go right out to the chemist around the corner and buy prussic acid and give it to the dog or even hang the animal at home. I've known that to happen. So, if a pet has to be put down, it's best for me to put it painlessly to sleep. But if I were that man, I'd watch out. The wife may decide to have him put down next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you know, you've, you, you're obviously uh, taught and yes. uh, writing, and so, mm -hmm. um, you know, do you ever get writer's block? Oh, yes, yes, sometimes. Sometimes you just can't get it right, and and other times you'll go to bed thinking about it and wake up at three o'clock in the morning and it's there. <laughs> <laughs> so, what kind of advice would you have mm -hmm. uh, for young people that may, maybe they've never written or maybe they mm -hmm. think they might like to write? A big waste basket. <laughs> Keep at it. Keep at it. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to get it right, but when you get it right. And I believe it was Dorothy L. Sayers, a murder mystery writer, who said this. When you finally get it right, you feel like God on the seventh day. <laughs> well, of course, uh, you and I come from maybe a, mm -hmm. a, an older school, because mm -hmm. nowadays with computers, I know a, a gentleman that, that I mm -hmm. knew that uh, used to use a typewriter mm -hmm. to write everything uh, in a day. He said when computers came out, he could just put out so much more material. <sighs> Did you find that uh, during your times? Certainly, it's much easier to access reference material, much easier, mm. um, much easier to take notes and so forth. It, it's a different process. If you are writing by hand or a typewriter, you have to think harder before you put it down because you know you're going to have to go back and fix it. With the computer, fixing it is so easy, and worse yet, it looks so good when you print it out. And you think, oh, I'm done and you don't revise the way you should. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So revisions, you know, because again, this is getting into writing. Mm -hmm. so, so again, what is the best advice you would give a, a writer mm -hmm. just starting out? You said a wastebasket, but, yes. but really, mm -hmm. is it uh, write about what you love? What, what about it? You have to know what you're writing about. And I do think that with Harriet, with the Harriet book, I lived 30 years on a working farm 
near Mayville, North Dakota, where the people are largely descended from Scandinavians, mostly Norwegians. And that was the kind of people Harriet was working amongst, because Yorkshire has a very high population uh, that has been descended from the Vikings. And a lot of the place names and people's names are definitely Scandinavian related in Yorkshire. And the whole business of working on a farm, I think um, raising children on a farm, uh, having animals on a farm, I think that's a very healthy thing. And it, it made me capable, I think, of working with Harriet, for one thing. I don't like to think about reading Scandinavian murder mysteries and thinking of personal experience. But um, certainly the, the patterns of people's thought are similar. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Well, thanks for that. If people mm -hmm. are interested in finding out more or getting mm -hmm. a copy of your book, where can they go? Who can they contact? It's out of print. I think there are electronic copies available, but it's it's an old book now. It was came out in, in the 90s, late 90s, so it's very hard to get the, the real thing. But I think the electronic versions are available. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. Denise Lajmadir is an artist and poet who enjoys conducting writing workshops for new writers. She encourages them to write often and from the heart. Listen as she reads a poem from her book, Dragonfly Dance. Something spark an idea. Anything you want to write about. I think we have some of the most creative people, uh, native young people here on our reservation that are excellent artists and writers. Poems for Dragonfly Dance probably started when I was 10 years old and I had stopped writing for a while uh, when I was in high school. There were no other native writers and I thought, well, Indians don't write. And then I picked up a book called Love Medicine and it was by a female writer, Louise Erdrich, and not only was she Chippewa, Ojibwe, but she's from my tribe. She came here to the reservation, her and her sister Hyde Erdrick, and they did some workshops. Louise sat with me under a bur oak tree, and she looked at me and she said, you can write. So that gave me the confidence uh, to put a manuscript together. In my book, Dragonfly Dance, I talk about the dragonfly that, that changed my life. It, it just looked at me eyeball to eyeball just was right in, just right in front of me, looking at me while I was dancing. Suspended above our plumed and feathered heads, the dragonflies joined us for grand entry at Red Lake, the sun striking flames from their sapphire wings, these winged mounts of ancestor spirits returning to heal. I move and step with the drum, I dance with the dragonflies as one drops down to gaze into my face with its lovely bright eyes. I hold its gaze, this holy creature, spirit of the water, born of the water as I am. Life, birth, power of love made constant. She spins her beaded body to join the dragonfly dance as my wings join their rhythm, my feet vibrating. Seven, three, I am willing five, to seven, teach anyone five. who wants to learn how to write poetry. Doesn't have to rhyme. You know, you can you can pick any one of your sentences, any one of these, and write a haiku. I spend time with uh, ten to twenty-three students writing poetry, writing memoir. Uh, others have uh, worked with them in writing fiction and flash fiction. Are doing art. Are blending the two, the poetry and their art. I strongly believe that an image is yet to be created that will change the world. Maybe not the whole world, but just one, and this vision of mine will continue. A lot of young writers don't like, a lot of writers, period, <laughs> don't like to revise their work. So I work with them in revising, looking at uh, line length or just what the poem looks like on the page and so on, and their thoughts, but encouraging them to write. Just keep writing. So for the next 10 minutes, just write. Find a mentor, talk to them, write to them, join workshops. And when we do poetry workshops, we warm up the brain attached to our hand. 
One of the best things I was told by Louise is when she was reading one of my poems, she said, what's happening here? What happened here? And so I told her and she said, write that down just the way you said that. So other mentors have said not to try to use fancy high flutin words that you don't use every day. So I talk to the students about uh, just writing down and I do the same thing to them. What's happening here? And write that down just the way you told me. You got some ideas? Just write and then, then we revise, 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 revise. A lot of it is button chair, just keep writing. Write, write, write. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Post this week. As always, thanks for watching. Funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.